AI has massive benefits for automating and streamlining, I would think, more tedious, redundant, and time-consuming tasks. If we can offload these kinds of tasks to AI, I think that humans can then work on more complex things that they're more suited to, which involves maybe critical thinking, involves creativity. So essentially, I think what this will allow humans to do is to scale to problems that they've never been able to scale before. Hi, I'm Boaz, founder and CEO of Simply Augmented, and I'm excited that you're tuning in to Shift AI, a show that explores what it takes to thrive and adapt to the changing workplace in the digital age of remote work and AI. In today's episode, I'm thrilled to have Vasi Philoman as our guest. Vasi is VP of Generative AI at AWS and one of the key leaders helping to shape the future of AI in the cloud. One note to mention, this episode was recorded one week before the drama that ensued at OpenAI and the firing of CEO Sam Altman. I hope you find this interview interesting. It's great to have Vasi on our podcast. Let's get to it. Vasi, thank you for joining us. I really appreciate you coming on to the Shift podcast. It's wonderful to have you. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Well, I always like to start talking about some of the experience that you've had in the world. I noticed that you were a leadership position at Philips for many years, and now you're at Amazon, but you did a lot of different jobs at Philips. And I was really impressed with, uh, with the work that you did there. You were the global head of marketing and business development. And then you were also the general manager of Philips City Touch, but now you're the vice president and general manager of machine learning and AI at Amazon, which honestly couldn't be a better time with so many amazing things happening at Amazon and all over the world. So d did I get that right? Are there so some things that I missed about your work history? No, I think, I think you got it right, but there's a there's a theme to it. Um, so back in the 90s, I did a PhD in computer science and I specialized in machine learning. It was a time when nobody was talking about machine learning or AI. A lot of my friends and family that thought I was nuts back then, they think I'm a genius now, but I just happened to like the topic and I, I studied this topic in more detail. So when I actually started my career, um, I started as a scientist, um, but then I quickly realized that I wanted to do more than just research. I, so then I switched over to you know, building products. Um, so I, there was a moment in time when I was a director of R&D where my team used to build products. And we, we typically worked on very cutting edge technologies. So we worked on speech and vision. Uh, we worked on 3D solutions. We worked on topics like that. And then finally, I think I got my big break as um, part of this um, Philips lighting topic. So the, this was, I think, in the 2011, back in 2011, when LEDs were taking off. And this was a analog to digital transformation in the Philips lighting group. We, I started with uh, one of our biggest businesses was street lighting. So it's functional lighting. The job is just to light the streets so that it's safe for people to drive in. And so I started with that because that was the biggest uh, business that we had. Uh, what I ended up doing was take the take our lighting fixtures, put a cellular chip in all of them, also a GPS chip as well. And then I did deals with AT&T and Vodafone to use their cellular networks. And then I built a backend on AWS. That's kind of how I got introduced to AWS. Uh, and AWS was still young at that time in 2011. And so the backend was what is called City Touch. So cities could then log into City Touch. They would see a map of the city. And then they would see all the light points on them because I had the position um, from, from the GPS chip. And then they could interact with the lighting through the cellular network. And so they could change the level of lighting. They could change the colors. They could measure energy. They could do maintenance work and things like that. So essentially connected lighting on a very big scale. That was my transition from you know a scientist to a product person uh, and then becoming the general manager of the business. And uh, now I'm doing that at Amazon and very excited to be part of the generative AI transformation that is happening right now. Well, we'll get into that for sure. But before I do, I know that one of your first jobs was interesting job in Germany while you were still at the University of Maryland. Talk to us a little bit about that. What was the first job that you actually got paid? So I was actually a PhD student trying to figure out what my thesis topic should be. Right. And so I was doing that at the University of Maryland and there was a, the time for a summer internship. That was kind of the opportunity that came about. And I, I actually went to Daimler Benz in Ulm, Germany. I remember it was supposed to be for a short period of time, but it extended. And I think 
It lasted six to eight months where I was working in the field of computer vision, which is, you know, understanding through cameras. And at that time, it was still very early days. It was back in 1996, I think. Yeah. And so the what Daimler-Benz was interested in, they're the makers of Mercedes. And what they were interested in, autonomous navigation back then. And so the first steps to autonomous navigation had to do with trying to understand objects that you see. You will not only want to detect them, but you also want to track them because you want to detect, you know, if you're going to crash into them or not. It was called real-time object detection from moving vehicles or something like that. And we actually demonstrated it in a car too at that time. And the compute power wasn't there. And so we, I remember having to load these huge uh, dual processor, Intel, Xeon, Pentium uh, uh, processors and, and the computers back at the back of the car in order to demonstrate it. As we were driving, we would find these traffic signs and we were able to show people uh, how the research could actually be applied in the real world. You were so early. It's interesting to think about the computer vision that was happening at that time. Now, I know that you spent most of your life in the United States, but your family's from India. Talk about the kind of family conversations that were happening around technology, business. Did you always know that you were going to get into technology? Or you're, what, what did your parents do? So my family is full of doctors. I'm a doctor too, but I'm not the medical kind, <laughs> right? So my parents are both doctors and my brother is a dentist. And I think the dinner conversations were always about all of them wanting to me to study, to become a surgeon. That was kind of the, the dinner conversations that we used to have. And it was sort of a given that I would go in that direction, but um, I was more into math. I was more into things like math, probabilities. It was very different from, you know, the kind of things my parents would read about and the kind of things my brother would talk about. So this was something that was a thing that really, and, and my parents were very supportive of it. Um, they were very supportive of it. I, I think I kind of always knew that I want to go into computer science, computer science where there's heavy influence of math and computer science normally is logic and algorithms, right? But there, there are some aspects of computer science that require a lot of mathematics. And I think AI is one of them, which is probably what drew me to it, even though nobody was talking about it back then. Well, given your background, it couldn't be a better time to be doing what you're doing right now, which I want to talk about. We're looking very, very closely at what Amazon's doing. There's obviously been very big announcements in the last couple of weeks. And we have reInvent coming up at the end of November, which is going to be really, really exciting given all the announcements that we're seeing within the industry. Talk to the audience a little bit about what you're excited about right now and what you're doing at Amazon, especially in the Gen AI space. So I think before I tell you more about what we have done, I think it's it's interesting to know where it came from. So prior to us announcing anything, uh, I, I think a lot of us were talking to a lot of our customers, uh, which is kind of always how things happen at Amazon. Um, it, you typically work backwards from these customers. And so when we were talking to customers and we were asking them, you know, what are what are some of your challenges in taking generative AI and applying it to your business? We kind of came back with three overarching themes. The, the, the first one had to do with some of the customers that have already played around with, uh, you know, some of the models that were available. They realized quickly that uh, their one size doesn't fit all. They're going to need diff access to sort of different kinds of models. First of all, there are different families of models. Some, some are called text to text, right? Text in, text out. Some are text and image out. So there are different families to begin with. And then also within each family, I think um, different models work better for different use cases. So customers are, that understood that early on, um, and also there's trade-offs, you know, between cost and latency and accuracy. It's not always about the most accurate model. It really depends on your on your use case. So all of those things led customers to ask us for give me uh, like give me access to the best of best models out there in a very simple way. I don't want to manage all the infrastructure behind it. So give me API-based access, but let me access all the different best of breed models out there. That was sort of the first theme. The second theme was our customers knew, given what AWS and Amazon in general do, which is democratize access to all of these technologies so that everybody has access to them. They knew that we were going to make all of these tools also available and capabilities available to even um, their competitors, right? And so to everybody, but that'll include their competitors. And so the second theme was, how do I differentiate myself from my competitors? If you guys are going to make all of these things available to them as well, right? Like that was sort of the second theme. And then the third theme, I think, was cost effectiveness. Like uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, right now, if you look at it, 
a, a lot of the use cases that you may have where the, the cost may be much higher than the value that generative AI provides. And that is going to be prohibitive to really scale it out. You can always do a, a very cool demonstration. You can show people, you can get people excited as to what is possible. But I think the key is like, how do you really take it and apply it at scale to real world business problems? And now that's what Amazon is very, very good at, taking technology like generative AI and applying it at scale to real world problems. And, and I could just give you a quick bunch set of examples. I'm sure all of the listeners are, are aware of it, right? So the, the first one, of course, is in the back in the 90s, right? If you bought a book on Amazon, um, people that bought these books also bought those books, right? That is machine learning applied at scale. It, it's a technique called collaborative filtering where you try and find you know, what people would like based on other people that may have bought similar things. right? And we applied it at scale back in the 90s. And then you fast forward now, we have Alexa in more than 100 million plus households. And there are a billion interactions every week with users through voice. That is machine learning applied at scale. right? And then you look at things like our fulfillment centers, like where I think we ship 1.6 million packages a day. And if you've ever been to one of our fulfillment centers, you'll see it's a place where humans and robots kind of work in tandem, uh, doing essentially the same things, but not stepping on each other's toes, right? And it's beautiful to see at, at that scale how, how these things work so well. We understand how to take these technologies and apply it at scale to real world business problems. And in order to do that, you have to think end to end. You have to think across the stack. You can't just think about, okay, I'm just going to build this great model that's going to solve every problem on earth. That's not going to help you really get adoption. Uh, it's not going to help all the businesses take that and actually use it everywhere. You've got to think, think end to end. And I think that's exactly what we're doing. And so with, with that background, um, we ended up launching Amazon Bedrock, which is a new service. We think that Bedrock will be the place where a lot of developers come in and then build generative AI applications on top of Bedrock. And Bedrock has the things that I talked about. It has number one choice. It offers the best of breed foundation models on it. So uh, we're talking about uh, foundation models from um, not only from Amazon, the Amazon Titan family of models, but also from others like Anthropic. And uh, they have their cloud models. They've got Meta's Llama 2 will be will be the first managed service with uh, Llama 2 models available for customers in a very easy uh, fashion for them to consume. Then we've got Cohere, uh, we've got Stability AI, we've got AI21. And so we've added a whole bunch of model providers. It's, it's very early days. And I think that's what people miss. And in early days, you, you want these choices. You, want, you never know what's going to happen. And you want to have these choices. And um, what appears to be a front runner at the beginning is never the front runner in the end. And, and that's why it's important for customers to have these, this choice right now. The second thing Bedrock does is to tackle the second theme, which is customization. How do I differentiate myself from my competitors? And the way it does that is, you know, allow customers to securely use their own data, which is their um, uh, intellectual property, right? They want to be able to use their own data to make these models their own. And we offer a bunch of customization workflows in a very secure private fashion that only the customers have full control over, you know, the customized model, the data, and all of that. We don't even get to see what they're doing there. But we want to enable them to do that, right? And that's Bedrock offers those workflows. And then the last piece is because we we have to constantly innovate on the cost side and bring down the cost so that we can we can gain adoption at scale. Uh, you know, we've built our custom chips. Uh, we've invested for the last two years already. We've invested into Trainium and Inferentia. These are two chips, one for training and one for doing inference. And EC2 instances that have these chips are available. And the key key thing to take away there is they're 50% better price performance than any comparable EC2 instance we have. And they're specifically meant for generative AI. So again, this, this has the end-to-end -end stack thinking. It's not just the model, it's the workflows around the model, it's the infrastructure behind it, and it's all of that. And so that is the sort of the strategy that we're taking uh, and giving customers choice, uh, given it's very, very early days. You touched on something that was really interesting to me. As you know, I build Gen AI solutions for companies, and they're constantly coming to me and saying, well, what about my employees? What about the humans in the loop? And I know when you talk about robots and humans working together in fulfillment centers, how do you think about humans in the loop when it comes to AI solutions and the way that this is all going to play out? AI has massive benefits for automating and streamlining, I would think, more tedious, redundant, 
and time-consuming tasks. If we can offload these kinds of tasks to AI, I think the humans can then work on more complex things that they're more suited to, which involves maybe critical thinking, involves creativity. So essentially, I think what this will allow humans to do is to scale to problems that they've never been able to scale before. I, I think that is what I think this is all about. So humans staying in the loop is absolutely what, what we need here. And not only that, given where the technology is right now, you definitely want humans to continue to verify the work of what the AI's, AI processes do or what the AI produces. You want humans to be able to verify that. I'm sure you've heard of things like hallucinations and things like that. These models are big. Uh, they just make up stuff. Although a lot of research is going into reducing the amount of hallucinations, you do want humans to verify the work that the AI produces. In the end, I think that the, it's all about augmenting humans. It's all about productivity uh, in terms of uh, what humans are able to do now that they weren't able to do before. I think that's going to be the key. That there's no doubt in my mind that, that together, uh, humans and AI can do amazing things going forward. Yeah, I agree. You know, one of the team members on our team that's been seeing a huge amount of efficiency is our senior developers, software developers. And they're using AI as a, as a junior developer, as an intern. They're checking all their work, but it's making them massively efficient. And tools like Code Whisperer, I, and I know that they're having a big impact on the way that we build software. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I've been really interested in, in those tools that you guys are putting out there. Yeah, I, I'm a developer at heart. Um, I still write code because that's the only way that I, I try to write code on the weekends just to try to keep in touch with all of the innovations that are happening in that space, new programming languages and so on. Like one of the things I like to do sometimes is to write some code, um, but not just writing code for the sake of writing code, either because I want to learn something new or I want to create a, a little application that will make me more productive. And um, so that's the kind of context in which I write code. I had to learn all. And so essentially many weeks went by and I was just learning and learning and learning and learning and I couldn't get to, you know, implementing anything. And so I think this is a problem that a lot of developers face today. It's there's just a lot going on. Uh, there's a lot of different programming languages, many, many frameworks and libraries in each of those languages. And then if you look on the cloud side of things like vendors like AWS, we've got, I think, 250 plus services. The, the problem is that developers, their life is hard to keep up with all of these things. And so that's one of the things that, you know, that was motivation for us to develop something like Code Whisperer. It, what, what we did after we launched Code Whisperer within the company is we just did a productivity challenge. We ran a productivity challenge. We took two cohorts of people, one cohort that didn't have access to Code Whisperer and the other one that did. And we gave them a bunch of tasks, tasks that they were familiar with but also tasks that they were that were new to them. And so what we ended up finding from that study was Code Whisperer helped the cohort that had access to, uh, it made them on average like 57% faster and they were also 27% more likely to complete the tasks. But overall, uh, there's no doubt that this is like something that boosts your productivity. And, and for me, I think the key point is that as a developer, no matter where you are in your journey, what tools like Code Whisperer does to you is helps you magnify your impact at, at whatever you're capable of doing right now at that point in time in that journey. So I think that's what Code Whisperer does. Now, something that we've just recently announced on Code Whisperer is sort of taking it to the next level, which is Code Whisperer is typically, you know, is familiar with general coding practices and coding guidelines and all of that that is out there. But if you're a company, it's very likely you've got a lot of internal code that you've developed over many, many years. Internal code is not something that Code Whisperer ever seen before. And also you may want to, you may want the rest of your organization to follow certain practices you may have. Um, and, and we have that on Amazon. We've developed a lot of internal tools. Like, so if we hire a software development engineer, we have to put him, him or her through a training program where they learn about all the internal tools and the internal frameworks. Now, what we've just done is um, help people enhance Code Whisperer, customize Code Whisperer, if you will, and have it in a very private and secure way, create a custom version of Code Whisperer just for your organization. That would turbocharge your productivity of your particular developers even more. So I think that's the kind of stuff that I see happening here. And uh, I think it's going to be huge for, for developer productivity going forward. Uh, we're at the beginning. There's a lot more to come there. I want to touch on something that uh, is close to my heart. I represent small businesses and do a lot of work on AI regulation and represent small businesses on a federal level. So I want to talk about responsible AI 
and the ways that you think about that and the way that you think it may show up in AI regulation. We just recently had the president issue an executive order, so it's on everybody's mind right now. Can you talk a little bit about the way that you see things playing out? Yeah. The first thing I'll say is Amazon is very much committed to the responsible development of all of the all of the AI products that we, we build. There's a lot that goes into it. I, I think we can point your listeners to a blog that I've authored myself with Peter Halinen, where we talk about what does it mean when we say responsible AI. In, in fact, what we did in that blog post is we defined what are the dimensions of responsible AI. So we talked about things like fairness, how do you make sure that the system doesn't treat different subpopulations of users differently? Things like explainability, mechanisms to understand the output of the of the AI system. Things like robustness, right? Uh, mechanisms to ensure that the system operates rel reliably, the AI system. Things like privacy and security uh, so that your data is protected. And then governance. Uh, how do you define processes to enforce responsible AI practices within your organization? Right. And then finally, transparency, I think, was a sixth dimension, which is communicating information about an AI system so that others who depend on your AI system can make informed choices about their use of the system. It could be a developer building on top of yours, but they need to understand what your APIs were designed for. And so we came up, we defined what responsible AI was, and then we, we introduced the notion of service cards. So a service card defines all of these along these six dimensions how your system was built and how your system is supposed to operate, what could be, what can it be used for, what you can't use it for, and things like that. And so that's one of the means how we um, we want to define what it is, then we want to help people talk about it in a, in a simple way that others understand it, and then we want to disseminate information in such a way that people can do the right things when they do this. We also believe in you know a people-centric approach, making sure that education, there's enough education around this topic. So we have a new free bias mitigation and fairness course from our machine learning university. Uh, it's, it has over nine hours of lectures and exercises. And you know, earlier this year, we joined the White House and leaders across government and industry to commit to continue promoting the safe, secure, and transparent development of AI. And uh, we also spoke at the United Nations to promote the responsible development and deployment of AI. Now, generative AI is more complex for responsible AI because with traditional AI, you are solving a narrow problem. And so it's easy to apply responsible AI to a narrow problem. With generative AI, it's, it's very broad. So it's a much harder problem. So it's not that we know everything, but there's constant work going on uh, in, in our teams, in my teams. So it's, it's an ongoing journey, but we're very, very committed to doing this right because we think that this needs to be done right for us to reach our goal, which is to have generative AI embedded in pretty much every function and in every industry and in every business. I'm glad to hear you say that because in the private and public sector, people that I've been talking to, bias is on everybody's mind. And it's something that people are thinking about and are worried about. And in the media has been promoting a lot of doomsday scenarios. But like you, I'm very optimistic, but I want to make sure that the guardrails are in place, so it's great to hear you say that. I want to segue to another human in the loop conversation, but it's really about mentors that you've had in your life and the kind of human interaction that has really pushed you in your experience. Who have been the mentors in your life that have really impacted you? Yeah, I'll give you maybe, I'll talk about two people. The first one, back up when I was a grad student, University of Maryland, one of my, my first advisor at that time was, uh, his, his name is Azriel Rosenfeld. He's no longer, uh, he's passed away now, but um, he was he was already 70 years old. He's widely considered the father of computer vision. He was also a rabbi. And the thing that I learned, I, I was a grad student, you know, I was uh, young. And, and what I learned from him is, is discipline. He would be the first person, he was already 70, I think 70 plus at that time already. He would be the first person at work at 7 a.m. in the morning, he would be there. At work and he would be the last one leaving uh like 6 37 and he would remember every detail about everything he had read and sometimes he would point to that page in that book or that page in that paper and 
So just that work ethic and that discipline was something that I really learned from him. Clearly, uh, in my mind, it's the first thing that would come out if you ask me about people that have impacted me professionally. The, the second person is when I was uh, in the doing the connected lighting business at Philips uh, Lighting. And my manager, his name was Jeffrey Cassis. Uh, he's, he's based in Boston. For me, what I, I learned, like I, I used to be a guy that would focus a lot. Like I got a lot of stuff done in very ambiguous areas over many, many years because I would focus a lot and I would say no to a whole bunch of things. Ruthless in prioritization and <laughs> say no to a whole bunch of things. The thing that I learned from uh, Jeff is, is, the, is the notion of yes, but, right? So if somebody's asking you something, my first instinct would be say, no, get out of my way, you know, let me, let me do my stuff. But I think, I think he taught me this whole notion of yes, but, and what that helps is better relationships. It helps getting more people into participating into what you want to do. Actually, it's, it's, it's a, it's a more inviting approach. There's always pros and cons in all these things, but I'd never thought of that notion before. And I remember distinctly that this was something that I learned from Jeff. I love that. So as you think about the future, so much has happened in this last year in AI and in Gen AI that's moving so fast. So I know it's hard, but as you think five, 10 years out, what are some of the things and technologies that you're the most excited about that are bringing you the most energy? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm in the digital world a lot. So... I think I probably will pick a bunch of physical world things <laughs> just to, just to, uh, because I, that's kind of how I am. I'm always looking to go where I'm not right now. I'm always looking to see what's happening in places where I'm not. Like, obviously I can speak about generative AI. Obviously it's going to have a big impact over the next 10 years, but you know, there's this whole concept of next gen materials. These are like com compounds and composites that have distinct features and they provide um, increased functionality above uh, conventional materials that we know of today. One example that I just came across is something called graphene. Uh, it's very thin and it's very light, but it's very, very strong, like several hundred times stronger than steel, right? And so I think this could be used in many different places, flexible displays, energy storage, electronics, a lot of applications there. So that that's one. Another example, another illustration is the self-healing materials, shape memory alloys, SMAs. It's like a new class of materials that can recover from deformation and they take on their original shape. So just imagine a car fender bender, <laughs> the material just going back to its original shape without me having to take it to the mechanic, right? I also think biotech and genetic engineering is there's a lot that could happen there. Um, things like biofuels, bioremediation, GMOs, genetically modified organisms and and things like that. So there's there's a lot ha that could happen there as well. So I'm I'm interested to in seeing what's going to happen there. These are kind of complementary to what I'm working on, but generative AI could actually be used in the biotech and genetic engineering world as well, for sure. So I always like to ask this question at the end. This is the final question. If you were to describe the future of work in two words, limit it to two words, you can elaborate. What would those two words be? Transformational productivity. Generative AI is about to unleash is really transformational productivity, which is productivity at a scale that we've never seen before. And we're just scratching the surface. We're very, very early. It's going to be one of the most transformational technologies of our generation, uh, as big as the internet, uh, if not bigger. And it's going to help us tackle some of humanity's most challenging problems, augmenting human performance and maximizing productivity at scale. It's such an interesting time, and it's so exciting to be talking with you at this moment where so many new things are happening. It does really feel like we're just at the beginning. Vasi, thank you so much for taking the time with us today. I learned a lot, and I was really excited to have you on the podcast. Rose, thank you so much for taking the time and talking to me. I'm looking forward to catching up soon. That's a wrap. Thanks for tuning in. Such a pleasure to have Vasi as our guest on today's episode. Vasi's knowledge of AI and ML and his leadership at Amazon integrating generative AI in Bedrock is very timely and fascinating. If you want to learn more about Vasi, you can find him on LinkedIn. And if you're interested in how he thinks about AI and ML, definitely connect with him and keep up with his posts and activities online. I continue to be amazed by the guests we've had on the show, and I'm excited about the ones joining us in the near future. I truly appreciate you spending time with us. Thanks for listening to the episode, and don't forget to subscribe to the Shift AI podcast for more exciting interviews. The Shift AI podcast is produced and sponsored by Simply Augmented and distributed by GeekWire. 
Our theme music was created by Dave Angel.